yours is an unusual band, so it's understandable that um, uh, it's understandable to see you take uh, go for unusual decisions. Why the need uh, to travel nine years back in time, back to your first incarnation, uh, Bodega Bay, and revisit our brand uh, could be your life. Mm. I think there's like three reasons. One is that those songs are, I think of them as like our first good songs. And Bodega essentially is no different than Bodega Bay musically or philosophically. It just had different members. But uh, the whole catalog, except for like, I think two songs that Joe Wakeman wrote were written by me. So uh, yeah, I, I see that as like a, a time when I really found my songwriting voice and discovered Bodega consciousness. And those songs always meant a lot to me. And I want to play them live and have them be part of our repertoire. But the original record was so aggressively lo-fi that not many people ever really listened to it. So it's been something I've been wanting to do for at least five years. Uh, at, um, so we got the time to do it. The The second reason would be I, I still think the themes of that record are, are as prescient as ever. Uh, it's like our first album in a way. Like Endless Girl was supposed to be like is like the follow up to that album, but ended up being kind of like the first representation that people heard from us. Um, so we felt like it really important that they heard our brand could be your life. Yeah, when we when we wrote Endless Scroll, well, first off, we wrote most of our first record Endless Scroll when we were still Bodega Bay, funny enough. Um, and then we heavily reworked it uh, once we really became Bodega and kind of a different style. But when I was writing it, I was thinking of Endless Scroll as the sequel. So there are references. How did you pick the songs that we're gonna stay and get rid of the well actually you got rid of 15 tracks out of the 30 that were in the original how did you uh decide which ones had to go and did you feel sorry about any of the tracks that were left out yeah um i didn't choose what i think were the best tracks uh in fact i purposely left some of the best ones there kind of hoping that the really brave uh, listener will go back and listen to that one as well and discover some of the hidden hidden gems. I kind of thought about it as what are the ones that I think would really suit the band that we have now? What are ones that I'd want to play live every night, theoretically, on tour? And what are the ones that kind of thematically play together nice? We ended up recording way more than the 15. Uh, some of them are coming out as B-sides. You can hear them on YouTube or at, over at Bandcamp. So we ended up, I think, recording like 22 of the 33. And, and three of those tracks were actually covers. Four. Um, oh, four of those tracks, wow, uh, of DIY bands that we were playing with at the time. So I think that's a really cool kind of DIY historical. Yeah, there, there was a band <laughs> called Doubting Thomas Cruise Control. They had a song called $10 ATM. And because we're all about ATMs, yeah. right, we have to cover them. <laughs> And this band called Milk Dick, which despite their disgusting name, is one of our favorite <laughs> bands ever. So the song Girls Had Needs is a Milk Dick song. Mm -hmm. Memphis is a cover of this band Perfect Teeth. And Alex Fippinger uh, had wrote a song called Israeli Girl, which we covered. Mm -hmm. So, you know. What that, were the aspects for, of, of the 2015 record that would stick to this day? Obviously, you said thematically it's still... Uh, it's still uh, very uh, actual. And what uh, were the ones who wouldn't stick to this day? Uh, that's well, a really good there, question. If, there, I if think... there were any, if there were any. Oh, no, there definitely were. Like some of the lyrics I rewrote on the new one uh, of songs that made it. Like, for example, in Bodega Bait, I used to say, uh, sorry, uh, in the bridge, which is actually from a song, Your Brand Could Be Our Life, which we just added to the bridge of Bodega Bait. I used to say, you've got something about you. You're right to hit the target market with your rock and roll. And I was kind of joking about sort of uh, in this extremely naive way, thinking like thinking of cheesy bands that I saw around me, kind of what I would call like the fashion punk bands that were kind of posery but we're getting a lot of success now flash forward nine years i'm way less naive and i realize there's hardly any money to be made in rock and roll and that initial critique was sort of juvenile it was like based on my memories of like gen x and stuff like that so in the new lyric it says you're uh you're gonna you know you're gonna make the corporation money but not 
with rock or roll. <laughs> a little bit wiser. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was also there was another song on the record called Yuppie Take a Cab. Yeah. And I felt like the word yuppie itself was a very like prominent word at that time, but now yeah. it doesn't kind of hold it just seems like a dated word that doesn't really cut at all. I mean yuppie is a fun word to say, but yeah, it's really like from the eighties. <laughs> it's from so. the eighties, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There's other things too, like uh like on on cultural consumer three i was sort of like play acting that the cultural consumer was kind of like this lou reed uh johnny thunders like lower east side guy so he was he was a little more sexual in this fun way i was thinking of like walk on the wild side or something like that so he, he used to say that's what i call real love suck me like real love and when we started redoing it i was like yeah, I think if I could be honest with myself, part of the reason I wrote that lyric was to just get like a shock response from the audience. Maybe that's why Lou Reed wrote his lyrics too, but I just changed it a little bit because I'm like, that's not really the main point of the song. Uh, so there's like little things like that, you know. Do you feel <laughs> that? Uh, do you feel that uh, you somehow put at risk uh, the natural evolution of the band by going backwards, or is going back? a way to move forwards in your case that's a great question i actually think it's it was a way forward because one one thing we really have been wanting to do uh is evolve the band sound away from just kind of traditional post-punk which is definitely what we were doing on endless scroll and become more of just like a straight rock band in the sense that we are more melodic uh it's sort of atonal, less doing like the talky vocal kind of thing. And it turns out that, that that's exactly what we were doing nine years ago in Bodega Bay. We kind of took a detour into post-punk, uh, partially because I realized at the time that a lot of people were misunderstanding the, the meaning of our songs back in Bodega Bay because they were so poppy and playful that I was like, people are, are really missing our social critique here, at least locally. And I found that the form of post-punk kind of allowed for the lyrics to just be front and center. Uh, but as we've toured and as we've really developed, uh, we're kind of, not only is that like a super overcrowded lane, but it's kind of become a little bit boring for us. So, you know, I, I still think conceptually we're kind of grounded in this art punk way. Really, our biggest influence recently has been just like the Beatles or a lot of 90s rock and roll, like like Pavement or Smashing Pumpkins or even like Sheryl Crow or something. We want to write big hooks, you know, mm -hmm. and um, but um, that's not to say that we didn't get any like kind of pushback when we first we just signed to the label Chrysalis mm -hmm. and we kind of presented this idea. And while we obviously always believed in it and never like faltered in our minds hearing that we wanted to go backwards for their first record for to put out this record with them for a first time they definitely were kind of like i don't know you guys are doing something interesting i don't really feel like you should kind of focus on what was behind so in a way it was like our first test to kind of prove the worth of these songs and i felt like once we had kind of convinced them and like showed them uh that you know, then I felt like we were super validated. Well, and... also, we didn't just exactly copy them. There are some mm -hmm. brand new songs on this record that we wrote last year, like Dedicated to Decades, a brand new song, track one. We just kind of wrote it in the style of Bodega Bay. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the riffs are new. You know, the, a lot of the arrangements are totally new. I, I've been telling people that we've been thinking about it like uh, when a movie director like adapts a book. <laughs> you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to have to leave out a bunch of the plot and you're going to add things as well and you're really going to make it your own so even treating the original source text as like something to adapt even though we made it you know like hitchcock did that all the time he would remake his own earlier movies uh yeah the general sound of the band uh like as you said has changed um uh, especially if compared to uh to endless scroll um mm -hmm. is is it has it got anything to do with the fact that you changed three fifths of the band during the during lockdown? Uh, are they different musicians? Well, of course they are, but uh, are they bringing something different? Is is are they a better fit for the band? Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it. Like Dan and me really, really bond over a deep love of Beatles, <laughs> so and. Uh, and a willingness to try to write like the perfect pop song 
or sort of pop formalists in that way. Whereas that was definitely not an interest of uh, our other lead guitar player, Madison. Uh, he's a formalist in a very different kind of way. Uh, and yeah, Adam C., our new bass player, he is a, is a philosophy professor. So uh, okay. yeah, makes that's, sense. That, that's his main day, that's his main day job. And so I think he that's, you know, ethics. like because our band is sort of, um, it's philosophy disguised as music. Uh, which is probably what drew him in. And so that's, that's a wonderful fit. And Adam Shumsky, our drummer, he's just an amazing drummer. And he's sort of like a songwriter's drummer where he, his fills and his parts are really trying to, uh, yeah, they're almost as important as anything else happened. And, and they're very, uh, very well thought out. So yeah. I, I think the band is, uh, the band is suited to the music and the music is suited to the band. Like I chose the material and what, 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 you know, what, what songs do I think Dan would be excited by? Cause I think I know his taste sort of well enough now. And you know? Dan and Chumsky, <laughs> they, their, their day jobs are as musicians where the rest of us, they play in wedding bands, do other like art that, or so. other things. So, and I think like they have this kind of jazz reaction to like, you know, we bring a lot of songs to them. Like they, when you join Bodega, you have to learn like our whole catalog, which is right now like 70 songs. <laughs> and that's like pretty tough, I think, for someone. And they can learn a song within like five minutes. They just have that ear and they like play in wedding bands. So they just like, if they don't know a song, they listen to it on their phone and then they can play it. And that helps a lot, I think, with the way that we want to approach music. Like, oh, we want to do this song tonight. You know, just that kind of like, flowing um yeah, our, our repertoire is way deeper than it may appear if you just look us up on like streaming services or whatever just yeah we, we we're like a definitely a quantity over quality kind and of we band. like doing covers <laughs> i think that's important as a band to try out covers and do your own I, I think it can help find your own sound uh in a way in a weird way how do you pick them covers covers a lot of times it's just what a song that we're really inspired by and we we always try to do them differently like for example we put out an ep yeah i guess it was two years ago now called extra equipment which is exactly what it sounds like it's songs that were from the broken equipment sessions but there are two covers on there one is a fugazi song and one is a stretch armstrong song called for the record and neither of them sound remotely anything like the original ones we like the more hardcore yeah the hardcore one we really slowed down and made very melodic and the fugazi one we really psyched out stuff it's probably the most psychedelic thing we ever tried to record it sounds nothing like the original fugazi song which is sort of perverse because we got asked that one uh we got asked to do a song for a fugazi compilation and fugazi is one of our favorite bands but uh it's pointless to just try to sound like Fugazi. So we, we did our own thing. How do we pick? It's usually kind of like things that are happening and like words that'll pop up. Like you, Ben has like a lot of different types of genres he'll pull from. Like during, we have like jam sec sections in our songs now. <laughs> mm. And I like early in the beginning, like if you, he took from like anyone from like Bob Dylan uh, uh, to Tierra Whack, you know, because there's just like, some cool lines and we can like weave them in and out of like, like a kind of a rappy track, like name escape or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think of like what we're covering is it's a way to highlight in this sort of meta textual way to get to, uh, it's almost like a, an illusion or, or a quotation. Yeah. Like, like my brain works that way. When I hear songs, I hear the, in a doubly way, like, for example, like, we haven't done this yet, but I've been hearing Pink Floyd's all in all, you're just another brick in the wall. I've been hearing that is all in all, you're just another post on my wall. <laughs> That's like the very bodega way to take an iconic rock thing and then spip it on its head. You know, Pretty much what he did with or the she... title of the album. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Or she, Sheena was a punk rocker. She, Sheena shops at Foot Locker. That's another right. one we've been doing. You know? <laughs> That's a good it's take. kind of antiquated in a way. All of, our, all of our stuff is still slightly antiquated, you know, like the like the ATM um, <laughs> itself. Like someone came up to us and was like, why do you keep using ATMs? They're not even like, like there's no, they're not like even part of like what we use anymore. Everyone just uses like Apple Pay and stuff. And that never really mattered to us because I feel like the, the it's metaphor, metaphor is still very strong. Yeah. And they look cool. That's the main thing. Yeah. And money <laughs> was something that you could touch instead of being something 
Ariel, you know, like, right. right. Even if it's something that we're critiquing, it's still something we're yearning for. Like, like this, you know, like the, you know, how, what is like the worker has been alienated from its work for a long time. Like, even when we're talking about our own alienation, we still want something tactile. <laughs> To, to answer your question, actually, though, about covers, though, is like, I think like the best covers are things that you feel like you could have written or that exactly expresses what you're going through. So like our on our record release show last Friday, we did a snippet of Bad Mouth by Fugazi, where the lyrics say, you can't be what you were, so you better start being just what you are. And that was, I, I selected that uh, for the repertoire just because it was directly commenting on us going back in time. It's basically saying we can never go back in time. We can't be who we were when we made Bodega Bay. This is who we are now. The, the, the sort of existential quality of that lyric I found really moving. And of course, there's a double reference because Fugazi is one of the bands from Our Band Could Be Your Life. This is, if you see how like that's kind of how the process works, there's got to be, there's always a little layer to it, other than it just being a wonderful song too. When you play uh, uh, someone else's song, uh, mm -hmm. Does it add like some uh, new three dimension to the track uh, compared to when you listen to it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, this is going to sound a little weird, but when we play old Bodega songs, we're covering those ones as well. Right. Because I'm I, I'm not that guy anymore. It's a cover. Is a song still um, a valid way to deliver a message. Do you feel that uh, the lack of attention get in the way of comprehension of the mes of the message itself? Uh, you said it yourself in one of your tracks, actually one of my favorite tracks of your discography, that the guitar is no longer a weapon; it is just an instrument. So, does it yeah. still work? You know, you, you also said in the, uh, the the beginning of the interview that. Uh, people weren't really uh, understand the, understanding that there was a message uh, behind your, tr your tracks. And uh, it got mixed out in the, in the way that, because it was post-punk what you were playing, so probably it's a compressed uh, track. And uh, you know, it's, the, there's less and less time to understand something, to comprehend something. How do you feel about it? Yeah, well, when I say message, I don't just mean that there's one message and if you are not 100 it's not propaganda you know there's not it's, it's not just one thing that i i want you to understand it's i like, feel it's more when i say philosophy message, i think it's more of a, a yeah. philosophical take on on life that you know yeah. you want people to uh to think to ponder you know to you know get a, a second thought on, on things probably but there's also like an emotional message too you know and that's what partially why i think the bodega bay approach is really strong where and protects perhaps more interesting than what we we're doing in the scroll because there's a level of irony at play where you have like really sweet sticky sticky uh melodies and gooey pop material but then something really biting is being said in the lyric you all of a sudden have an, an irony and a tension that perhaps doesn't exist on um some of the just straight up punk uh, material. But yeah, I, to answer your big question, I, I don't think that sort of political lyrics travel culturally in a, in a vast way, like perhaps they would have, you know, when Sam Cooke was singing his songs. How about but social, think, social lyrics, not just uh, well, political, yeah. Well, I know well, there's not. I know there's well, not much of a difference. It's uh, uh, yeah, I was gonna it's say what's pretty much the same <laughs> yeah. thing. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. But social sounds better than political in a way, probably. Right, because political means like okay, like who are you voting for? And blah, blah, blah. No, it means but being I, active. Uh, you know, yeah. just being an active. Well, of, of course it does. Yeah. Of course it does. Of course it does. Yeah. But but I, I was going to say, I believe, I really do believe that communication does happen in music. I wouldn't do it otherwise, but I think it happens on the individual level. And that's the goal. It's to really deeply connect with one person, not just like one person at a time, but really just one person, because that's all it takes. And if that, you know, I really do believe in art for that reason, where uh, 
Well, I, I have friends who like will have existential crises and be like, oh, maybe art doesn't have much value. I think it has the most value because it can literally change how a person experiences the world. And that's the goal. Uh, yeah. Do you ever see the IB? I'm going to give you a little antidote here. <laughs> Do you ever see the IBM video, The Power of Ten? No, I haven't seen it. No. So it's this really cool video of this couple on a blanket and it zooms in by the power of 10 so you go into well, it goes their out first well it goes, well it goes into their bodies it goes into their like molecular stru cell structure you go down to like a singular atom and then it'll expand outward i'm doing it opposite but expand outwards into space by 10. and i feel like in some ways it's a great metaphor of how we approach bodega is that we love to zoom in on the minutiae of every day get down to like one atom and kind of critique that atom <laughs> but then at the same time there uh we expand outwards and outwards and outwards and we do kind of consider ourselves a bit of like cultural commentators you know of this era and perhaps eras past and in the sense like um that particularly in the information age right now information is at its lowest for longevity. And what I mean by that, if you look at a meme from like 2017 or a website even, just as you know, short as back time of that, you won't be able to find the address or the sources that you want for an article because the internet is forever changing and things are, the data is getting lost or corrupted or it's no longer supported on today's it's, it's, it's shrinking it's shrinking in a the way internet's supposed to be this huge place but there are really only like 10 like an 10 elephant websites like with the memory posted. with the memory of an elephant right. yes that would keep everything and, and so and so yeah and, and i feel like in so much of what we're doing is kind of categorizing or like being like of this moment atm is at this moment and it uh it's supposed to in a way just kind of I think people hear our music and they're like, oh yeah, I already know that. Or like, yeah, you're talking about philosophy 101. Or like, I, the, people don't realize how interesting this moment is and how very particular it is in this time and in space. And I think when we get like a few years past this, it'll be more- uh, I, think, I think, yeah, the, the, the introduction of the smartphone, which is basically what you're saying without saying, is the biggest change maybe ever, and I mean that ever, to the homo sapien because it has altered our experience of reality and how our brain works and that's like when historians look back on this on this the last 15 years that's that's the only thing that that will be talked about really i think like, that's i'm why, talking like 500 years from now. that's why bookmarks it's like uh, uh, to me it's my favorite lyrics of yours it's uh i think it sums it up perfectly and but is there any stopping the degradation of mankind because of this crazed uh, crazed out use of technology uh are you uh i don't are you hopeful or or not well um it depends what you what you mean by hopeful i, I don't know if it's optimistic a do, you, do you think we'll just, reach we'll reach a point of no return and then we'll be forced to return or we just go insane I think well, humans are we're all cyclical right there's cycles and i don't feel like we're in a cycle that is perhaps deteriorating but it's mm -hmm. you know at, we're very really strange creatures well what do you mean by that you mean like the next generation will be resilient no i just think like as a entire species yeah. you know i think there will let's say if we're talking about the minutia of this i bet there will be laws in place against children having smartphones you know, there's already all these laws or all these um, court cases like, with kids suing their parents for showing personal things of them online. Or the city um, of New I York, thought... of the city of New York suing Facebook for uh, ruining their kids. Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, which I, think, I, like, I thought it was that, pretty interesting. Yeah, that is. I, like, I haven't even heard of that. <laughs> but I think that there's some much bigger paradigm shifts that are that like that's just the tip of the iceberg. Right. I'm talking about like certain concepts that we have taken for granted for the last 400 years are going to be gone. Like I think the concept of privacy will be seen as a blip on from say like the year 1600 to like 20 2005 or something. Because basically, imagine if you're like you're Billie Eilish 
all your text messages and all your, your emails are public domain now. They may not realize it, but they are. Because in the same way that people want to publish James Joyce's and Picasso's letters to their friends, mm, there will yes. be coffee table books of Billie Eilish's text messages, for example. Because when they die, there's no one that, that will stop that information from leaking. And they're using you know, Google or Hotmail or, or whatever, T-Mobile, whatever they're using, they'll say, well, that belongs to us now. And, and whether it does or doesn't, the information is just out there. And the same way, you know, you're not allowed to have, you know, it's like privacy just seems like a, a concept that, that won't, we're, we're kind of, people are trying to hang on to it, but I, I think the technology is way too powerful. Nothing is private anymore. So that's just one small example in, in the way that like, uh, homo sapiens are not quite prepared for the fact that they're performing every thought in front of an audience of six, seven billion people or however many people on earth, you know? And I, I think just for another minutia comment, I think we'll always be hopeful. That's like part why we make art, right? And, yeah, and I think the, well, we always <laughs> come back to the stripped down aspects of what we want as, as uh, humans. And I think with this technology, our idea of connection has really shattered in a weird, <laughs> in a strange way of like easier it gets, the more alone you feel. But I mean, with, the best of technology like i feel like i've gotten a great insight to other cultures i would never have gotten part of from their own words you know i've gotten i've even made friends you know online i i, I do have hope although like the overwhelming despair is pretty hard sometimes <laughs> no i mean what i believe in artistically from our band's point of view is live music i think it's one of the only things where you have that rare moment where you're with a bunch of bodies in a room and, and ai can never really replace that all right but speaking of which speaking of live music is uh is how the society is uh shaping up actually changing or affecting the connection uh that you have with the audience do you see that uh do you see that the audience change uh right before your eyes or do you think that during your career span it's been pretty much the same it just stayed the same i think it, i think it's been pretty much the same like when people go to a show they don't want to be looking at their phone unless they're bored with what they're seeing well we're not big enough for everyone to pull out their phone the entirety of the show you know i feel like there's certain bands or like certain like where like, Billy Eilish are using, like they'll yeah. like film the entire show on their phone and it seems like a wasted well that, thing, that that's like that's a uh, ages 20, 20 and below which uh, I don't think many people age 20 and below know about Bodega yet. <laughs> We're a very like, you know, 20 year old, 30 year old, 40 year old uh, it, well, audience. In some ways, I think our shows have only gotten better. I think as people engage with our music and realize there's such a rich, rich history there. Mm -hmm. And if you come to our show, you can, you see that we're rather, I wouldn't say combative, but we're very open to like, this is why we react, I think, really well to the British audience, because they love kind of jeering the people on stage and calling out and kind of like, you know, just like um, having a cool uh, dialogue between audience and, and band. And we love that as a, as artists. So like you, you'll, if you come to a Bodega show, we'll look you in the eye. Like we're always staring at people and it, they, we always get comments about how that's not usually the case. <laughs> Don't you feel that... Uh alternative music uh, and uh, live music in clubs instead of uh, huge arenas and uh, big venues. It's actually the safe yeah. spot. It's a safe place for music. And uh, does it, uh, I don't know, if I were you, I wouldn't crave uh, playing in a stadium for the same reasons that you highlighted, people will, you know, just pull out the uh, their phones and not pay attention, and probably you have a mixed up audience of, you know, just people who just want to be there, you know, punters or posers or whatever, and might not be there for the message, not for the music. Uh, doesn't it make you want to stay right where you are? Yeah, in a certain sense, it's really fun. It to play clubs and yeah i agree i mean we won't know until we get there i mean when we do like bigger festivals but do you want to get there do you want to get there do you are you afraid of getting there do you fear getting there 
We're not afraid of getting no. there. Uh, I don't think we'll ever w- have to w- worry about being a stadium band. I think there's only like three stadium bands on the planet, like U2, Metallica, I don't know, Taylor Swift or something. I think <laughs> yeah. we, like, if, we, if we ever get m- way more success than we have, though, I do think we would try to do things in different ways because we are music, live music fans. And I think if we were to do that, we would love to do like three nights in a city at like, you know, maybe a couple thousand cap room instead of a stadium. I feel like we would always choose, we would choose something like a little Stadiums are like 80,000 Or whatever. Cap. Are you always <laughs> Like the- We always the... talk about the, the we, we always talk about the, because uh, one of the mi- most misused words in English is stadium. People say, I'm going to see this band- That Madison, is a ridiculous Mad- take. They say, I'm I... going to see Madison Square Garden, a uh, show at Madison Square Garden, it's a stadium. That's actually an arena. And it's, it's an arena, culture. yes. It's, and it's one fourth <laughs> the size of a stadium. No one gives a flying. Well, well it's just yeah, like beat. if you're if you're seeing a band uh, in in like a hockey arena, that's an arena. It's not a stadium. Oh Big my god! Difference. Talk to the hand. But that makes a difference. Uh, that that's why LCD sound system played Madison Square Garden instead of playing. I don't know the New York Gen- uh, the 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 Yankees Stadium, which I don't know what the name for the Yankee Stadium is. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, yeah, they. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the name of the Yankees stadium. Uh, just forgive me for that. But um, I don't I, know it either. I don't actually. know either. I've been there and it I don't know it. It should be Yankee stadium, yeah, but you're right. It's probably like it should be. Um, bank or something. <laughs> yeah. Some sponsor. Yeah. They have, but you know, they opted for several nights, which is, I, I think it's, it's what you guys are talking about. It's uh, I think it's, it keeps it intimate. And it gives a chance to anybody to 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 come see you, you know, instead of just having a, a one chance and that's it. Um, yeah. May I ask you what your next move uh, will be if you have it planned? What are you gonna go for? If yeah, you have... we've actually. Yeah, sorry. We've already done a lot of work on further records. That's you know partially because we went uh, when we were working on this. We were also at the same time working on new music. So, so that's we've plural. already re- you, you said records plural yeah there, yeah All there's right. two there's two <laughs> there's two already in the works one is our an alter ego band called no dega and that's something we've already recorded and it's basically like the more aggressive side of bodega same members but it's sort of like influenced by early hardcore and early thrash it's a little wow. bit more riffy uh so that but that's meant to be like a, a companion piece to, uh, to, this, to our brand okay. could be your life. So because one it, of the interesting things. Are you revisiting tracks again, or are you just writing new material no, for, no. for the No Dega? Yeah, it's new material, but it's in the spirit of the Our Brand Could Be Your Life songs. Okay. But from like a way brattier, punkier kind of point of view. And then we've already have been really hard at work on what will be the the official fourth album, which I don't want to talk too much about because yeah, you still... have like 20, 25 songs already. <laughs> yeah. Wow. How do you yeah. feel about it'll be good though? <laughs> how, how do you feel about the uh, change of label? You uh, you now landed in the uh, Chrysalis world is uh, um, is it a, an upgrade? Uh, has it been an upgrade for uh, the way you make music or record music? Yeah, I mean, we got a bigger budget to record, and I, I think hopefully people can hear that on the new record. I mean, the album's only been out now four days, so it's hard to tell if it has it made a difference or not. It feels good though. <laughs> yeah, I think I think in some ways, they're. I mean, they have Chrysalis has such a rich, rich history, um, which was really exciting to be a part of. But also, like our old label, What's Your Rupture, Kevin, he's just one guy putting out. Um, bands he likes in his apartment and it's just as inspiring as like a whole team of people um that we have now in chrysalis and i think like the the same the similarities between where we are and where we were is that both labels really value the musicians and the art that they make which sounds silly to say but um i think we're not just like a number or like I, how i feel like there's a lot of other critiques about labels and particularly going bigger um that was like one worry of ours that we would be like the bottom of the pile but both labels um 
always treated us with respect and hear our opinions and and actually give us really good valuable critique that's like based in what what our world is <laughs> yeah the thing artists. about kevin is he doesn't really usually have more than one band at a time so he really puts all of his energy into the one band he's putting out and we're extremely lucky with jeremy from chrysalis um he like he put out he discovered like portishead um in he like sort of. well he sort of he like found their music and was like this is kind of weird and interesting i don't know if anyone will like it and put you know like he's such like a tastemaker so to be kind of brought into his orbit from someone who has like these amazing tastes is, it just feels like i don't know it's just like i feel like we're very lucky and very honored yeah the new beth gibbons stuff it's awesome so yeah speaking of port is that yeah. um, I have, a, I have great expectations <laughs> with, with with that album. Is there any? She's my uh, idol. Yeah, she's she's awesome. Is there any city related musical scene that thrills you these days? There's a lot going on in Australia. There's a lot going on in Canada. There's a lot going on in Leeds or uh, Dublin or uh, London or South London, uh, New York. Is there uh, anywhere in the world that? You would like to be right now or that you just feel fascinated by i mean there's great things happening in new york right now there's a uh, new band called consumables that i'm super into there's a bunch of really great bands in our city uh right now i think there's awesome things happening in atlanta i don't know if you know the band omni they're 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 maybe my favorite american band right now and there are also newer bands in Atlanta. They're doing really CDSM. interesting things. Yeah, this band CDSM. I was just going to mention them are really great. Uh, yeah, I mean, just... I mean, in some ways we're like it's like a world. Although you know the powers that be won't want this, but I feel like we do live in a world economy or a world like I I I really want world citizenship. Like I just like let's just get it over with. No more borders. You know, like, I just feel like there is so many cool scenes happening. I would love to just jump from each and every one and just see, get well, a taste. The next move is will be the abolishment of nation states and they'll just be corporation states. <laughs> so it'll be God. like, this is the land of Amazon. <laughs> this is the land of Chipotle. Well, I think we're going to be crypto.com. What do you say? Yeah. The island of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's been a, uh, it's been an honor to have you here. Good luck with your album. Good luck with your music. Good luck with the touring. And uh, uh, just, yeah, I'm very excited about all, everything you said about your near future. So uh, looking forward to hearing new albums and new music. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. It's Thanks been for great having us. Talking to a legend.